O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Good morning. morning. Welcome to Emmanuel on this beautiful Sunday in Advent, the second Sunday of Advent, as we prepare our hearts for the coming of the King. Uh, Today we look at John the Baptist and what his role is in calling us to prepare ourselves uh, for the coming of Christ. Uh, Who was he? What was he really all about? Because I think people get John uh, wrong, so we're going to get John right today. We also celebrate Christ as he comes in his body and blood, and I remind you to review those questions and statements on the front of your service folder to prepare your heart to receive Christ as he comes in his body and blood. I invite you as we begin our worship to rise and greet one another uh, as we begin our service of hope. We remain standing for our opening hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth. Restore us, O God, let your face shine, that we may be saved. Turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see, but let your hand be on the man of your right hand the Son of Man, whom you have made strong for yourself. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. O God, our Father, you have set forth the way of life for us in your beloved Son. We confess with shame our slowness to learn of him, our failure to follow him, and our reluctance to bear the cross. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. We acknowledge our sinful nature and confess our sinful thoughts, words, and deeds. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and put a new and right spirit within us. Upon this your confession and by the command of our Lord, I, a called and ordained servant of Christ, forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Go in peace. Amen. We join in our hymn of praise.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come to us with your presence. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and grant us a deep and abiding peace for all of our days. By the working of the Holy Spirit, lead us to share that joy we now know as your gift. Keep us in true faith until the coming of your everlasting kingdom, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We light the Advent candle as we sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall counsel and spirit of the Lord counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion, and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Romans chapter 15. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another and accord with, Jesus, with Christ Jesus, that together you may, with one voice, Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ, has be Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, 
Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise. We speak together. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. Alleluia. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. Alleluia. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. When Jerusalem, then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan was going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. But when, they saw, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. For our confession of faith, we confess together Luther's explanation uh, of the second article along with the article of our Apostles' Creed. In the second article of the Apostles' Creed, echoing the proclamation of John the Baptist, we confess Jesus to be the Savior, the one who fulfills God's promises. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. You may be seated. I invite the boys and girls to come forward for a children's message.
They were the person who shouted out loud. So they found somebody with a really loud voice, and they hired them to tell people what was going on. They would tell you what time it was. They would shout out when it was noon or when it was 4 o'clock. And the other thing they would do when there was news is they would go to the corner of the marketplace and they would shout out, Hear ye, hear ye. And they would tell you all the news of the day so that you would know what was going on in the world. That would be a really important job, wouldn't it? To be the person who has all the news? Yeah. Well, as things developed, we developed a newspaper, right, where we could print out the news every day. And maybe some of your moms and dads still get a newspaper. But in the early days of the newspaper, the paper boys still worked like a town crier. They would stand on the street corner and shout, Hear ye, hear ye. And then they would tell you what the headlines said. The president did this, or, or there's war over here, hoping to get you excited enough that you might buy the newspaper and read the whole story now that you've heard the headline. So how do your mom and dad get news? Avery, how do your mom and dad get the news? They watch it on TV. Yeah, they watch it on TV. Some people get it on the internet. It can come in your email. There's all kinds of different ways to get the news today. Well, when you think of that town crier, that person shouting out the news, that's really what John the Baptist was. John the Baptist came because he had really important news. He said to the whole world, Hear ye, hear ye, the king is coming. That would be really important to know, wouldn't it? The king is coming. Wow, he's coming to our place? Yep, he's coming to your place. And you know what you'd better do if the king is coming? You'd better prepare, right? We need to get ready for the king to come. Now, John was kind of a strange guy, right? He wore camel's hair, he wore like a fur suit with a belt around his waist. He ate bugs and honey. You like bugs? Oh. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, he had a strange diet, that, but it reminded everyone of the Old Testament prophet, Elijah, who was supposed to come before the Messiah. So when John came, he began to tell all the people of Israel the great good news that the Messiah was coming. And he, had, he was like the town crier for everyone, to get them ready and give them that most important news. Well, now we're in the season of Advent. And we need to remember that as we get ready for Christmas, we have some pretty important news, don't we? What's the news we have about Christmas? The king is coming. What's his name? Jesus. King Jesus is coming at Christmas. Do you think that's something that people should know? Yeah, that's a really important message. So you know what your job is? Your job is to do this. Hear ye, hear ye. Jesus to come. You're the one in your family and in your community that has the job of announcing the great news. Now, the person who tells the news isn't the one who makes it happen, right? They're just the ones who let everyone else know what's going on. And Jesus is coming. And our job is to tell everyone else. So when you go back out into the world, I want you to remember what your job is and tell everyone. Hear ye, hear ye. Say part of a prayer and you say it up to God. Say, Dear God, dear God, thank you for the great news. Thank you for the great news of the coming of your son. Of the coming of your son. Help me, help me to share it with everyone. To share it with everyone. This great news I have. This great news I have. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for coming up and spending a moment with me. Join in our message song.
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament is a challenging uh, section of scripture or book. People misunderstand what the Old Testament is really about. People think that the Old Testament is a series of laws that show you how to be in the club as a follower of God. That, that God wants basically good people to be perfect by following these rules. And if you want to get to heaven, then you have to be perfect. And following these rules is the way to do that. And that seems difficult. That seems onerous. That seems hard for people. And when they view them as rules to get in the club then it gets even more difficult because then they seem sort of arbitrary and strange. So if you were pledging a fraternity or a sorority, part of that pledge process is they put silly rules in place, right, to test your loyalty. Now, when I was in college, I uh, pledged to Phi Mu Alpha Symphonia and uh, professional music fraternity. And we have a couple of fraternity brothers here. And anytime I ran into one, and we'll see how well this works, I had to say, once a symphonian, always a symphonian. And they responded, yes, long live symphonia. Is there a purpose to that? Am I a better person for having said it? Is Dale a better person for responding? You'd better believe it. Bonus point. <laughs> but people view the Old Testament rules sort of that way. If I want to be in the club, then I have to do these kinds of strange and arbitrary things uh, in order to show my loyalty to the brand, to show my loyalty to the group. But Paul tells us that that's actually not what the Old Testament was about at all. That the Old Testament is not a book of rules to weigh us down or bad news that God is angry with basically good people for not being perfect people. Paul, in our epistle lesson, tells us that the purpose of the Old Testament was to give people hope. When you read the Old Testament, do you come away feeling hopeful and encouraged? We should, but because of our fallen human perspective, we often don't. You see, the Old Testament isn't the story of a God who made these rules to test people's loyalty. That he took basically good people and demanded that they be perfect. The story of the Old Testament is about a God who created people that he loved passionately. And when they became broken and in bondage to sin, not good at all, that he made a pledge to them that he would come himself and set it right. That he didn't say to them, follow all these rules and then you can show your loyal to me. He didn't say to them, if you make yourself like this, then I'll accept you. The good news of the Old Testament is that God came when we failed utterly and said, I still love you. And I'm going to come and put all of this right. So then what's with all the rules? Here's what's with all the rules. You see, when we understand that we lived in a perfect kingdom with perfect relationships and a perfect love relationship with God, it was a blessed and beautiful kingdom. And God says, don't wait until I come again to live like that. Don't wait to live the blessed life. Don't wait to live like it was in the kingdom. Have the good life now. What does that look like? Love and care for your neighbor. Serve one another. Give generously. Bless instead of curse. Forgive radically. Not because if you don't, I won't accept you, but because that's the kingdom you're supposed to be living in now. Why would you wait for heaven to live the good life now? Why would you wait for heaven to live into those principles that will be part of your existence in the future? So I'm going to lay it out for you in the Old Testament what the kingdom really looks like. I'm going to lay out for you in the rules 
the way that you're supposed to be living together when everything is good and right. And in order to prepare yourself for the kingdom to come, and in order to receive some foretaste of the goodness that I have for you, I want you to live that way now. Why would you wait? Why would you waste the years that you have living in selfishness and misery and greed when at least in some small way you can begin to live together the way you're going to in the future and learn to live and love and serve in a way that will be your nature? Because you're not basically good, you're basically broken. And so we need it in the form of rules. We need it in the form of laws that we can understand and and kind of sink our teeth into so that we can live out kingdom principles. Because for God, it was never about rules. It was never about regulations. It was always about relationship. And so the rules are there to reinforce what the relationship is supposed to look like that's there to set an understanding and clarify for us what our lives together are supposed to look like and what our life with him is supposed to look like. And that when the world sees people living like we used to live in the garden and like we will live in the world to come, that's going to resonate with their spirit. They're going to see that and say, I want that because somewhere deep in my soul, a part of me recognizes that as what I was supposed to have. Something recognizes that kind of community and love and grace as the kind of world in which I'm supposed to be living. And it's magnetic. When you get into the Old Testament and God is laying out that vision for them, when you you live according to my laws, when you live in the way out of a relationship with me that I'm setting up here, you won't have to go out into the whole world and preach about me and tell everyone about what I've said They're going to see you, the way that you live and love and the way that you're blessed, and they're all going to come. Isaiah, over and over again, paints a picture of this great mountain where the city of God is, and the whole world is rushing to the mountain. It was magnetic. It was exciting. It was engaging. That's what the Old Testament was about. That's the hope that it gives us. Not that we can become something by our own effort, but that we already are something because God has said, I love you right here, right now. And then he gives us a picture of a better life than we would have made for ourselves and invites us to live into that in preparation for the kingdom to come. So when God is finally coming, when he's fulfilling that promise, and he's going to show up, he has this problem that in the, what we call the intertestamental period, in the few hundred years between when God stopped speaking at the end of Malachi and the New Testament begins, <laughs> the Pharisees and the Sadducees have come along and they have rewritten the understanding of God's laws. They have stopped seeing them as laws that govern a relationship and paint a picture of the way life is supposed to be and see them as the steps you have to take if you want to get to heaven. They are the rules you have to follow to show God that you want to be a part of his fraternity or sorority. They're the things you have to do to demonstrate your loyalty and that you are moving toward perfection which is the way most people hear it today, and not at all what God was saying in the Old Testament. So when God is getting ready to come in the person of Jesus to start this restoration process, he has to correct the issue in the community. And so he sends John. Because what he doesn't want to do is double down on the law, right? No, I'm really serious about this. You really have to take it. No, God instead peels it back and reveals the relationship that the law points to. John the Baptist is not actually the first character in the New Testament story. John the Baptist is the last character in the Old Testament story. He shows up as the final prophet to Israel 
from the Old Testament to speak to them about the law and the picture of hope that it paints and then point to the one who is bringing that hope into the world. So he dresses like an Old Testament prophet because they've said that Elijah will come before the Messiah. If you go to a Jewish Seder meal, if someone invites you there, there will always be an empty chair. And the empty chair is for Elijah. Because if Elijah comes to their meal, they want to invite him to sit down because it means that God is coming. The Messiah is at hand. And John then dressed in those clothes. Camel's hair, a belt around his waist, ate food from the wilderness just like Elijah did. And he has a similar message. Prepare the way for the Lord. How do you prepare the way for the Lord? Not by digging deeper into the rules. Not by trying harder. But instead, by pouring yourself fully into the relationship that you're supposed to have with God. And the relationships around you that are supposed to grow up and be blessed because what God is giving you is flowing through you into the world around you. And so John's message is not follow the law. John's message, John does something really kind of strange and unique in Jewish culture. He invites them to have a fresh start with God, to be baptized in repentance Repentance means to turn around and walk back to God, acknowledging that you've walked away. This was a rite that existed in Jewish culture, but it was only for converts. At the end of several years of education and practice, when you were accepted into the community, one of the final rites as a Gentile becoming a citizen of Israel and a follower of Judaism is you would walk down into a pool to be baptized and then walk out, leaving behind you all of your Gentile ways and your Gentile life and starting fresh with God. And John said, if God is coming, don't just try harder to follow the rules. How about we just have a fresh start? How about we all get baptized like new converts and leave our old sinful lives behind in the water and rise up out of it and begin walking toward God? If he can do it for the Gentiles, why can't he do it for you? And so John's whole mission and ministry was about reconnecting people to their relationship with God. You see, that call that the king is coming, when a king was coming to your community, when a king was coming, they would announce long in advance, years in advance, that he and his entourage were coming because you had to make roads bigger. You had to smooth things out. You had to do all of those public works projects because when he passed through, you wanted the king, one, to be impressed with your community because at some point you're going to ask him for money or resources and you want him to remember you well. And two, in order to honor him, his way should be easy. The valleys that John talks about are not the moments when we failed and dug ourselves a hole with God because we didn't obey They are the moments of hopelessness when we didn't trust God. They are the moments of hopelessness when we were giving up, when we were living apart from him and our relationship was broken. And he says, fill those in. Fill that hopelessness in. The mountains that he talks about are not the deeds we have to do to scale our way to heaven or to win God's approval. No, those are the moments of self-reliance and pride when we stood before God and said, I can do it. I'll do it myself. Just watch me. And instead, we piled up these mountains of pride and self-reliance. And God says, I don't want you to rely on yourself. I want you to rely on me first. I want to be the first one. I want to be the relationship that carries you through everything else. Cut down that pride. Cut down that self-reliance and lean into me. Have hope in me. Trust in me. And see what your life becomes. See how the road of your journey goes. When you're living, believing I have good things for you. And trusting in me to give them rather than earning them yourselves. Right? We go on these valleys, right? I'm, I'm going to do it. I have this grand dream. Oh, it's not working. I'm a horrible person, right? Oh, but I have a new grand dream. Oh, but no, it's not working. I'm a horrible person. And Jesus says, why are you on that roller coaster? 
Cut that down. Fill it in. Walk in hope. Walk in trust in me. The final message of the Old Testament spoken by John the Baptist is to restore your relationship with God. Our Advent call, our Advent call is to lean into hope and trust. This is a call, it's a penitential season, but it's not a season to say, am I following the rules? Do I need to get my act together? God certainly has a right to show you where you can do better. But it's never about winning his approval. It's about calling you to lean into him more, to trust in him and find your hope in him rather than your plans and your schemes. The question of Advent is, Am I ready for a relationship with God this year? Because he's coming. His coming is soon. At Christmas, he'll appear in our midst. Are we ready for that relationship? Are we ready to pour our lives into this Christ child and begin to build in our community and among us the kind of community that reflects the relationship with God that we've always dreamed of and the kind of life we're going to be living in the kingdom that Jesus is ushering in? Is it here first? Are these relationships ready? That's John's call to prepare yourself for the coming of Christ. May we as an Advent people stop and reflect on that relationship and the way that we're living it out and make sure that we're ready for Christ as he comes among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise as we go to the throne of grace in prayer. Let us pray for the, <clears throat> for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Come, O Lord, among us, that as people united in faith, <clears throat> we may witness to the good news that is ours in Christ Jesus. With hope we pray, come, come, Lord Jesus. Come, O Lord. Come, O Lord, with your presence on earth that in those places where strife and <clears throat> discord rule, there may be times of peace. Come to our nation that we may find joy in that which is done the, through it by the leaders and by uh, the people. We hope, with hope we pray. Amen. Lord Jesus. Come, O Lord, and walk beside us that your, that your love and blessing be evident in all that we say and do. With hope we pray. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, O Lord, and bring your response to the special concerns of our hearts today, including health and family needs and situations that are part of life. We remember Mike, Linda, Adeline, Pat, Ed, Megan, Carol, uh, Tony, Ev, uh, Elvin, Linda, Barbara, Jerry, Carmen, Catherine, Sue, Martin, Tammy, Betty, Rob, Jen, Jim, Michael. Those we name before you in our hearts. With hope we pray, Amen, come Lord Jesus. For all those who have completed their earthly journey in faith and now rest from their labors in eternal peace and joy, serving as witnesses of your never-ending care, we bless you, O Lord, and ask that we also be numbered with the saints in glory everlasting. With hope we pray. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we worship the Lord with our gifts of love and offerings, we remind ourselves why giving is a call of discipleship with our offering dedication. We speak together. Everything we have is a gift from God. All that we have and are belong to God, bought with the blood of Jesus. Lord, help us be a people who live lives of sacrificial generosity so that there are no needy persons among us. Let us be generous because our Father is generous, and it is our joy to share his generous heart with the world. You may be seated.
We join in singing our presentation hymn. Please rise as we present our gifts to the Lord. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for you have established your kingdom of peace among us and have brought to us the joy of your salvation in our lives. Above all, we bless you and give thanks for the limitless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son as the fulfillment of your great promises. Through the working of your Holy Spirit, bestow upon us your supporting presence, O Lord, now and forever. Together with angels and archangels and with all who rejoice in the courts of heaven, we praise and your glorious name. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the very night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, Jesus took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith to life everlasting. Depart in joy and peace and remember your Savior. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have again welcomed us at your table and have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in your eternal kingdom. Grant that the body and blood of our Lord now within us keep us joy-filled and secure in your love. Bless us through this divine gift that we may live with, ass with assurance and confidence even in times of earthly sadness and sorrow. Grant that your Holy Spirit enlighten us with his gifts that we be people who rejoice in your promises and live to your glory. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for our departing hymn. before we go. Uh, Wednesday Advent midweek services start this weekend, or this weekend, on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. One service at 7. It will be live streamed if you'd like to join us from home if you can't make it out. Um, so join us the next three Wednesdays as we prepare our hearts for the coming of the Savior. Uh, next Saturday weather, or Sunday weather permitting is our um, living nativity out front on the 11th. 
Uh, we're still looking for a few people to fill out the cast for that. There's no speaking parts. You just get in costume and, and wave at cars and as they go by. Um, so if you're interested, there's information in your news and notes. Um, and uh, finally, a couple of weeks ago, I announced that I had received a call to the Lutheran Church Extension Fund to become a vice president of Ministry Solutions, um, an opportunity where I would have a chance to work with about 1,200 churches uh, on leadership development, visioning, uh, capital campaigns, and the like. Uh, and so we have been deliberating that call along with the call to Emmanuel. Uh, and as a person who has always been invested in uh, the greater church, I feel really compelled uh, to take this opportunity to join the Lutheran Church Extension Fund and have uh, a broader reach in ministry. Um, so I will be stepping down from my call at Emmanuel uh, in January officially and um, beginning of my work with the Lutheran Church Extension Fund uh, as God has been leading my family and I in that. It's not all as bad news as it might sound to you. Uh, Matt Hager is going to come up and share with you uh, the plan moving forward. Yeah, just, I just want to make a couple of points on, on Pastor John's announcement. Um, I mean, I, I think it's a fabulous opportunity that he's got to go and help to lead the broader church. I think we congratulate him. I'm just really happy for this opportunity for him and his family. Um, the nature of the call means he physically doesn't need to relocate, so he's staying here in, in Batavia with his family. Um, and as part of that, then, um, Pastor Kay has offered to remain with us as an interim pastor while we go and uh, fill the void of um, senior pastor. Um, so it means he's probably going to be preaching more weekends than not here, so you'll still see him here present. Um, he'll provide some support and guidance as he's able to um, throughout the week, um, but what we have to do then in the uh, Mission and Ministry Council and the Spiritual Guidance Committee is then review his roles and responsibilities, accountabilities for everything that he takes care of and figure out how do we cover those things while we're in this kind of interim state. Um, also, we anticipate, uh, we've got an active call committee com call committee right now for the associate pastor role. We'll just repurpose that into a senior pastor call committee is our expectation. Um, and uh, we've got a uh, MMC meeting coming up on December the 13th. We'll, we'll go through these with, with pastor and uh, discuss and um, confirm our way forward. So um, I think that's all I wanted to say. And thank you and congratulations again. Um, so we covet your prayers in this transition. And, and as Matt said, we're not actually going anywhere in the in the short run anyway so um, we're going to continue to stay and at least uh, help out with services and things uh, as I'm able um, so with that uh, please stand as we remind ourselves who we are and whose we are with our sending that we serve Emmanuel God with us wherever we go God in us making us new God through us his hands and his feet you are blessed to be a blessing alleluia alleluia